Well, welcome to another Marshall Moment here at the George C. Marshall Foundation. I'm Paul Levengood, president of the foundation, and uh, this is a little bit of a change for us. We've normally done Marshall Moments as video features, but we are jumping into the world of podcasts. So this is uh, uh, to our guest. This is our first venture into this, and he's watched us try to set this up. So he, he can tell we're new at it, but uh, I'm really delighted to have today uh, Dr. Jim Lacey as our um, as our guest, he is a professor at the Marine U.S. Marine Corps War College in Quantico, Virginia, and he has a long uh, career. I won't go get into it all except to say that he is a uh, author of more than 12 books, very impressive list, and his most recent one is The Washington War. And uh, Jim, welcome to the Marshall Foundation. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Well, good. Well, we'll kind of jump right into it and, and start off at least with a just kind of a general question. Why did you want to write this book particularly? Well, that's probably the easiest question of the day. Um, <laughs> I read uh, Team Arrivals, Doris Garwin Kearns, and was massively impressed. If I had about one half of my heart talent, I could retire on this book, but I guess I didn't quite get that far. You didn't get as much money from your publisher as she did? Not, yes. Not, not quite. Okay. <laughs> not quite, but okay. I'm closing in on it. Okay. Um, so I was sitting there and said, boy, I could really use a book just like this for my classes if there's one out there in World War II and got on Amazon, checked, checked a couple other references to find a book like it, saw that there was none, called my book agent. He said, write me a proposal. And two weeks later, I had a contract and I said, I guess I'll write the book now. Yeah. So in your teaching at the War College, uh, you find, I should backtrack and say, this book is really about the battles of World War II that no one knows about. They're the ones that took place mm. not in the far reaches of the South Pacific or in Europe, but took place right. in the office buildings and the government of Washington, D.C. Yeah. As uh, my, my bosses, who actually read the book, my, his favorite quote from the book is, uh, battles are won on battlefields, but wars are won in conference rooms. And uh, nobody ever thinks about the conference rooms or does not give them the proper attention uh, writing military history is just more fascinating if you write about battles and massive movements and blitzkriegs and bombings and the and what military historians generally write about. Um, academic historians will write about a deeper topic, and then I said, you know, I can write about the deeper topic and make it for a trade audience, a bigger, wider audience would be interested in this. Um, so yes, we have a book that talks about Washington, D.C. during the war and all the fights and disputes. For a time when the mythology is we're all pulling together, you read, you, when you look, pull back the onion one layer, you find that it's not quite like that. There was lots of disputes, lots of fights. They were all working towards a common goal, but nobody had a specific, nobody had, n no two people shared how we were going to get to that goal. Right. And that became uh, the basis of this book. Well, and let's talk a little bit about those people. You begin the book actually with little brief bios of how many is it? It's like four dozen, some, there's a quite a few of this cast of characters. Right. And I'm incredibly happy I put that, put that in there. I, in researching and writing it, have become so familiar with these characters. I'm like, why would I slow the book down with this? The editor insisted, and I tried to make it punchy and stuff, so right. it wasn't just a bio. I gave you something to hook that name in your memory forever, hopefully. Um, but then I looked at the Amazon reviews and about a third of them, and some of the reviews in the newspapers have also said, well, thank God he had that little reference sheet that I could just go back, because some characters will pop up on page 20 and then you won't see them again until page 75. Right. It's good to have something that locks there, that uh, some little tidbit that locks a memory of who that person is in your mind. and. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad I put it in now because the uh, people who are reading the book was like thought that was the most helpful part of the book was reading that. So And the book really good. is, in a lot of ways, about those people, about it, their interactions with each other and, and how they got to the solutions to the, some of these problems in a lot of ways. It is. And, um, you know, it looks like there's a lot of characters when you look at the beginning of the book, but when you figure these the characters, these, not characters, these individuals, and many of them were characters, um, that were running a global war for four years, it's just not that many. And they all knew each other, they all interacted, 
And I think one of the things that amazed me during the research was just how they interacted before the war and how much impact that had. So, for instance, you have p characters that are forgotten today. Uh, Senator Burns, who ran the Office of War Mobilization. General Marshall knew him when he was a colonel working for Pershing then became friendly with him when he was assigned to South Carolina to send it his home state and they would go hunting. And then when he becomes chief of staff, every time he needs something from Capitol Hill, he goes to Burns. Right. And you see all of these linkages and um, that, that how they created networks long before the war started. And I, I was tempted to change the name of the book in the Washington War to the Battle of Networks because his individual networks and how they all worked and how they interacted that really made the difference and and got us there. I mean, the right people are in the right place at the right time, but if they didn't have this supporting network or these contacts that they could reach out to, they would have been totally ineffective. Sure. And of course, knowing people sometimes also makes uh, fights all that much, all that much uh, more intense because you do have a history with some of these people. Um, yeah, most of the dysfunctional events that happened during the war that I've forgotten about. You know, Jesse Jones, who ran the reconstruction finance company, absolutely tested the vice president. And that becomes a very dysfunctional right. thing during the war. Um, the president asked Jimmy Burns, the senator now running, who really set himself up as a deputy president, get him in a room and lay the law down. And he had to dismiss the meeting as it was coming to a fist fight between the president and a high-ranking government official, <laughs> vice president, government official. He just went to the president and said, we can't fix it. We just have to move one of them to one side. And it was the vice president who got moved to one right. side. And he, he had hopes of being on the ticket in 44. This is Henry Wallace. Henry we're Wallace, I'm sorry. Yeah. And being president again be after, after Roosevelt. And Roosevelt liked him because he was a new dealer to his marrow. But because of his fight with Jesse Jones, um, and the, it irritated the president, he gets thrown off the ticket. The president's first pick was Jimmy Burns, but um, even in 1944, a, a senator that had the full endorsement of Ku Klux Klan was not going to get on the ticket. And uh, <laughs> they had to um, remove him from consideration. Harry Truman was going to uh, nominate him at the convention. and. He had to go to Harry. He had to go to Harry Truman and say, "You're not going to nominate me. We're nominating you." And <laughs> that was the first time Harry knew he was going to become the vice president of the United States. Right. So tell me, of all these figures, uh, if you had to pick one you wanted to hang out with and spend some time, wh who, which, uh, which, which one? I am dying. I wish I could have met Leon Henderson. Okay. Tell um, us about Henderson. A Leon bit. Henderson is almost forgotten in history. And I, was, as I was talking to um, you before we came in here. He, uh, I, I said his name briefly. I was watching a movie with Gene Arthur, one of the great actresses of the 1940s, pretty much forgotten now. Um, she said, you'll be as hated as Leon Henderson in the movie. And I laughed. And nobody knew what I was laughing at because he's forgotten today. Right. But he took over the Office of Price Administration, and his job was to keep inflation to a minimum. And he was highly successful. And people would advise him, don't do it. You'll become the most hated man in America. And he did. But he was a, one of those people who had no friends, so no need to make friends. And it, it's summer in Washington, D.C., and there's not a lot of air conditioning yet, so he always worked in his underwear. <laughs> he said he, you know, he had six fingers so he could stick them into more people's pies. He got in everyone's business. <laughs> but he was incredibly and extremely effective. Um, probably shouldn't say this. It's something that's going to be posted online. I... I actually called up his sons, uh, one in New Jersey, I think it was in California, and they both hung up on me. They wouldn't talk <laughs> about their father. So I guess I guess something was wrong there. And, you know, once I'm not talking about my father, and he hung up. But he just seems like the most fascinating guy in the world. And in a little-known dispute um, right now that's forgotten, the biggest civil-military dispute of the war, the feasibility dispute, which is not in many history books e today, um, he was the deciding influence. He's the one who broke the back of the military argument and forced the issue. And if you read the book, I, I think I credit that it probably sh shaved a year off the war and saved, you know, just by doing that alone, probably saved half a million American lives and countless millions of lives around the world. So that one guy at that one time, at that one moment, the most hated man in America, mm -hmm. Did what he had to do, and I don't think he gets wrecked. You know, who who today knows who Leon Henderson is? And he had the 
one of the most decisive impacts on World War II. Right. What story that you uncovered surprised you the most? I mean, you you know a lot about this time period. What, what really stands out? The I went into the book not expecting to find many disputes, many arguments. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying it's a specific story. There was just so many of them. And what stands out is how that didn't, it, how it came, all those fights led to a much better decision and a better outcome than if there had been no fights. Because there's it a lot of- It seems counterintuitive in a way, right? It does, but um, you know, when you look at Adolf Hitler, nobody argued with him. There was no fight, no dispute. I'm sure there was things below his echelon where they're fighting. But once a decision's made, everyone goes for it. These people would fight with the president if they thought, th thought he was wrong. General Marshall, if, if his people thought he was making a serious mistake, would tell at him and they'd fight him tooth and nail. And sometimes he would change his mind, sometimes he says that's it. But it got everything aired and you don't get to, the, you may not get to the best decision, but you always got to an optimal decision with the biggest buy-in from the most people. Uh, and that, that's critical. And the ability to debate that is critical. So if Adolf Hitler does something or orders something and one of his high minions doesn't agree with it, uh, he's, he's not going to help it along. It's going to die in the process. And this really retarded the war efforts of countries or um, caused immense casualties, which you see on the Russian front, because the, the independent thinking is not being listened to. Right. So if there was one thing that really surprised me was the impact of fighting and disputing for getting to an optimal decision that really worked. I mean, it's kind of messy, but it's a, a hallmark of a free society in a way that is a, it stands in contrast to those totalitarian societies. Right. It's beyond messy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's literally ugly, and I'm sure it was even uglier than I was able to find. I can only read what somebody wrote down, and... Uh, you know, all these gentlemen and ladies, who, and um, in this point of history, it's mostly all gentlemen. They, um, they, they were careful in what what survived and what they put in their biographies and what they left in their papers. And uh, there's, yeah, I hate to be one of those guys that read for, read between the lines. So I, I use that for, and these two don't like each other. Now let me find out why. Mm -hmm. um, and if I couldn't find any evidence, I, I leave it alone. But um, the other thing about this is competent people got to the top and incompetent people got ran over and nobody cared about being nice or being politic right. at this level. And the respect that engendered in everybody. I, I'm, it's, you know, they brought Robert Patterson, who was a number two guy in the Pentagon, in with the production czar and... Uh, you know, basically it ends with, I still think you're a son of a bitch, and I think you're a son of a bitch too, but we'll, we'll, work to, we'll be able to work together. Right. Um, these, were, these were tough men, asked to do tough jobs. They were, um, they, they had to run over people. There's X amount of resources, two tough guys want them, and they're gonna fight over them because right. their job, they see it as the most important. And when you see real weakness, no, not, you know, I need to pick on him because, you know, maybe he's got grandchildren out there. Donald Nelson is supposed to be in charge of war production, but he was never strong enough to harness these guys behi behind him. And it, it led to more dysfunction than just about anything I saw. They needed somebody in the head of war production who was just mean. And eventually yeah. that turns into Jimmy Burns and... You know, as Bruce Catton, a Civil War historian, wrote after the war, and Bruce Catton was head of public affairs for the War Production Board at, during the during the war effort. And he said, uh, well, Jimmy Burns was great. You know, he brought two people in. If you said two plus two was four, and I said it was two plus two was six, Jimmy Burns would tell us it was five, and we all we'll all walk out happy and agreeing with him. <laughs> but the other side of that is Jimmy Burns. Um, could not get you to come to an agreement. His next mission in life was to destroy you. And he was the probably the best political infighter in Washington. There was very few people Jimmy Burns targeted that survived. Right. But he didn't target you because he didn't like you. He only targeted you when you were incompetent. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, so I'm never against the fights and disputes I see in Washington, D.C. as long as they're 
leading to a productive outcome. Right. Was any just curious? Was any of this showing up in in news of the day? I mean, was Drew Pearson ever talking about this stuff even obliquely, so that when you saw, was did anybody um, have a notion this was going on outside of yes, the government? Th- yeah, many of these fights turned up in the newspapers and the editorials. Then drove Roosevelt absolutely nuts. Mm-hmm. And one of Jimmy Burns's missions when they became the what he called himself the deputy president. The president didn't like that, but he had an office right down the hall from the president, and you know he spoke with the p- power of the presidency behind him, and he had written executive power handed to him that made him literally the most powerful person in the U.S. next to the president himself. And the president had moved on to what's the world going to look like after the war. Right. Um, and that, that was his entire focus, and he left Jimmy Burns to run the country. And rule one was... You, when a, when a debate, when a dispute got in the newspapers, you had to go visit Jimmy. And uh, if J- Jimmy couldn't end the argument, they had to pick which guy was going to lose, and, he had, and that person went away. Um, not very easy to do when you have people at the caliber of, of um, the pr- Vice President of the United States and um, Jesse Jones, but um, for anybody under that level, the one, of them, one of them would be taken out by Jimmy Burns. Mm-hmm. So you you talked about Roosevelt here a little bit, and and it's funny because I think in the preface you say you were going to attempt to write the book without really focusing on Roosevelt at all, but you found you could not do that. How did you? Well, how did you go in thinking about Roosevelt before writing the book, and how did you come out thinking about FDR as a as as a uh, as an effective leader at, at this time? He is a president that is effective without ever being efficient. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, He had a style of the presidency that it would horrify a business professor at Harvard. Um, um, I I consider myself a Republican, so I do not like a lot of what what I thought about the president, but I never sat down and researched him. And I don't know if I like, still like what he did from 32 to 38 and all of that is immaterial because there was nobody in the that came across that I came across in the research who could have done what the president of the United States did during World War II. So is FDR a great president? Absolutely. Um, he put himself at the core. When there was a tough decision to be made, he made it. Uh, there's a book out there by a story, I forget his name, I'm sorry, Greenfield, I believe that analyzed all the decisions that the president made. He overruled his joint chief 17 times during the war. Uh, That takes an immense amount of confidence in the middle of a world war to say, my joint chiefs are wrong, we're going to do this. Um, His his style of leadership is just maddening. He would usually give two very important people the same job and let them get at it, and then then when they they got to a point where they were arguing and couldn't be resolved, they had to come to him, and that was his way of keeping his, pul- his finger on the pulse of everything that was going on, was to overlap responsibilities and overlap um, people in charge, and then wait for the disputes, and then he would become the final arbiter. Right. Um, so in efficient terms, that's a terrible way to do things. There's a lot of things that didn't have to be big disputes or fights, you know, that could have been settled well below the presidential level, but that was part of his style. So if you, you can't write him out of World War II. You, you know, it's impossible because he's literally at the core of everything. He is the maestro controlling all of the major decisions of the war. Everybody, everybody, whether they knew it or not, was playing to his tune. Um, so I, I went in with one opinion of Roosevelt. I finished with a completely different one. I, I don't have to like it, some, all of somebody's policies to believe that that was a great man. And I take Marshall on that. Marshall went in to talk to him about the Philippines. Marshall had a very low regard for the President of the United States, and I think that was, they shared a low regard for each other for a little while. And then he went in and talked about the Philippines and MacArthur, and the President made an instant decision that surprised Marshall and said, I would left that office that day, put aside everything I thought I knew or what I liked or disliked about the man, and raised my estimate. I knew at that point I was working with greatness. And that didn't mean they didn't fight, they didn't dispute, didn't mean they didn't have policy discussions that were argumentative, 
it just meant that there was a level of respect. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in my own life, I don't care who wants to fight with me. I, I, I feel I, I'd rather have a really good enemy I can respect than a good friend that I can't respect. Well, let's talk a little bit. We are at the Marshall Foundation. Let's talk a little bit about how Marshall figures into your work. He's a prominent actor in your book. Mm -hmm. um, I thought there was something very interesting. You, you talked about Marshall um, and ambition, which sometimes I think Marshall is seen as this sort of um, almost empty vessel. You know, he was just pure and whatever. You make a really good point about him and his ambition. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, nobody gets to be chief of staff of the Army without ambition. And, you know, and Marshall was as ambitious as anybody, but I could say the same thing about all the Joint Chiefs during the war. King Arnold, when you look at their record and you look at their letters, I mean, and we'll talk specifically about Marshall, there's a couple of times he wrote to Persian, help me get on this next promotion list or I won't be, you know, right. I won't be, I'll get too old to be considered to be a general. I need to get back with infantry soldiers uh, or I won't make general. He gets, when he goes to South Carolina, he's like, well, I'm gonna be a supporter of the New Deal because those are the people that are gonna get promoted in mm -hmm. this administration. Now, it, it probably was a strong supporter of the New Deal and that's all the evidence is, but he made every decision along the way with an eye to being promoted. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, if you're a spirit guy. What they did not do, none of them, and particularly Marshall, was ever bend their integrity to get a promotion, refuse to tell truth to power, or do any, you know, if they came into a, you know, or avoid a hard decision, they were always ready to do that. They would always bet their next promotion if they thought they were right. Um, so being ambitious is not the same as being a toadying, um, that's a word that comes after toadium. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> being a toady that just does, right. you know, whatever your boss does, because none of them were that at all, and none of them tolerated that around them. Um, Arnold has the best, uh, love it, one of the wise men after the war was deputy uh, Pentagon, deputy in the Pentagon, but he was in charge of Air Forces, so General Arnold was the, um, was the chief of the Air Force, and somebody said, how did he get things done? He goes, oh, it was uh, horrible. He's the worst administrator in the world. His idea of getting something done was to tell someone to do it and then forget about it. And the person interviewing Lovett says, did that work? He goes, well, not always, but no one ever stayed around to disappoint them twice. <laughs> <laughs> These are hard men. Um, you know, the, the, the great point is where Marshall's um, selfless service comes in on the story you hear all the time is when the President of the United States had to decide who was going to be the commander of Overlord and the invasion of Europe, Marshall coveted that job. The president knew he coveted it. And when the president asked him about it, he selflessly said, Mr. President, that's your decision. Well, he also knew that Stimson, the Secretary of War, and many others were pushing Roosevelt to pick him for the job. He was so sure he was going to get it, his wife was already packing out their baggage um, to move out, of the, move out of quarters one where he was living. Um, so he might, he was probably a little surprised. He probably had a heads up from Stimson. We can't prove that, that he wasn't going to get it. And when the president took it, he said, you know, once again, Mr. President, I serve at your discretion. He never said, no, no, I really want it. And, you know, he never begged for it. Um, but he wanted that and he wanted it very badly. As he told Roosevelt, who remembers chief, who remembers who was chief of staff and one who remembers Halleck, right. everyone remembers right. Grant. Um, you know who who knows who was who was the uh, sec you know the chief of staff during World War One. Everyone remember, re knows Persian, and I'm not even going to tell you the name of the chief of staff. But if we have a hundred historians listening to this, two will put, two will have the name at the top of their heads, and the other 96, 98 of you are probably running to the Wikipedia now and find out who it is. Um, but nobody remembers the chief of staff, right. and uh, Marshall is remembered because. No, no chief of staff before him wielded the power. Marshall could fire Eisenhower, and the country would accept that as a wise decision because it came from Marshall. And Eisenhower knew that. Uh, I, he, could, he could probably have even fired MacArthur if he really wanted to. Howard couldn't fire Grant. General Marsh, I'll give you the name, could not have <laughs> fired Pershing. Um, he remade the office of... Uh, the chief of staff to become the actual coordinator of victory, the architect of victory, 
Everybody knew Marshall was in charge, no matter where they were, what front they were on. And he had the respect of everyone below him. Um, I, don't th I think a lot of that disappeared when they remade the military in 1947. Um, it, it's very hard for the Title X actors who are the Joint Chiefs to actually control their combat commanders, the COCOMs, the commands we have spread around the country. I see that changing now. The president, the chairman is now the main advisor instead of all the chiefs being advisors. And there's a realization that as China and Russia come up as peer competitors again, that we need better control at the top. And that's, I, I see that beginning to happen. Um, and hopefully if we ever need a marshal again, he's, he's in the ranks. We don't know who he is, but he's probably there. Well, that's good. And that's an optimistic note on which we will and so, uh, Jim Lacey, thank you so much thank for sitting much. down for this Marshall moment. Thank you very much for having me. Truly enjoyed it. Is that good? <laughs>